Hello, uh, Mohammed Bhai. Thank you so much for uh, agreeing to give us this wonderful interview in this wonderful uh, St. Ethelberg's um, Church. The date today is uh, 24th of March 2017. Let's start with your early life. Uh, just introduce yourself and uh, tell me where were you born? I was born in South Africa uh, in the capital city called Pretoria. And I was born in about a mile away from the city centre. But uh, a mile away today sounds nothing. When I was a little boy, a mile was very, very big for the simple reason that I was born in an Indian community. And there was a law that was passed by the South African government in 1885, which said that all Indians could not live in a city centre. They had to live away. For sanitary reasons, they had to be relegated to a little urban ghetto. And so we were relegated to one particular part of Pretoria, where we had to trade, where we went to school, where we lived and where we died and where we were buried. And so if we had to come into the capital city, we had to make sure that we left by sunset because in the capital city we were not allowed to use any amenities. We couldn't use a washroom, we couldn't go to a restaurant, we couldn't go to a hotel, we couldn't use a library, we couldn't go to a university, we couldn't stay long in the shops. So that was where I was born. The area was called Marabastad. Today it's known as Marabastad. But when I was born, there was one part of Marabastad called the Asiatic Bazaar. And that's the bazaar in which I was born. Tell me a bit about your uh, ancestors. Obviously you were born in mm. South Africa, but your uh, ancestors all come from Gujarat. That's so. Uh, can you tell me a bit about them? Yes. Uh, I was born in 1945. And that was about almost 50 years after my grandparents came to South Africa. My grandfather, Manji Kishabji, was born in a place called Chotila in India. And in 1901, he came to South Africa. His elder brother called Jivan Kishabji came in 1894. And his other brother called Velshi Kishabji came in 1896, 1897. So all these people came to Africa from India. Our family came from a place called Chotila in India, which I think it's on the road to Ahmedabad. It's Sorry. about 60 kilometers from Rajkot. It's a little taluka, a village, but it's an administrative center. And they came all the way to Africa and started a business. Actually, they came initially to better the economic situation and started as hawkers in the street. They were selling little trinkets from door to door in a little, in a little wheelie, like a little pram. And in that type of pram, they'd have vegetables, they'd have fruit, they'd have little mirrors and combs and, uh, you know, keys and locks and things like that. And they went from door to door to sell this. Originally, um, your uh, grandparents and your great-grandparents, they moved from Kachiawa, that's the that's that's yeah. area. And what was the reason for them to migrate to South Africa? Well, the 19th century was a period of great change in India. The British colonial system, in a way, changed India from a producer to a consumer. So you found that Indian industries were then broken down and British materials had to be used in production purposes. That's why Mahatma Gandhi didn't wear any British cloth. He, he thought about the spinning wheel. It was an emphasis back on India's industrial capacity that they wanted to recapture. So to answer your question, economic conditions as a result of British colonial policy was one of the reasons. The second reason was a drought. Gujarat and Katya were prone to a lot of droughts. The third reason was famine. And I have a statistic in my book that I think in the last quarter of the 19th century, 28 million people died 
due to the famines. So people had to go wherever destiny took them. I think there was a Gujarati proverb that said, it's better to go to Africa and die when death calls you than to remain in Gujarat and die an unwarranted death. There's a Gujarati proverb, there's a beautiful proverb. And so people just went where they could find a living. So some went to Fiji, some went to Guyana because of the sugar plantations. Others went to Mauritius, some went to Madagascar. In 1860s, the original Indians came to South Africa. In East Africa, they came for the building of the railways, 1890s. A lot of Punjabi Indians came there. So people went to wherever destiny would take them. And this is also in North America. If you look at Vancouver today in British Columbia, there are a lot of Sikh lumbermen. So the Sikhs have been there for a long time in Canada. So I think there was a push out of India for various reasons and a pull into the colonies again for various reasons as well. So, uh, because we're doing this project about Gujarat, I just want to have a little bit of background about the Ismaili community sure. in Gujarat. Yeah. Just give us a little uh, understanding of how the Ismailis originate from Gujarat. Sure. Ismailism is a persuasion or a tariqa of Shia Islam. And maybe I'll spend just a few minutes to explain to you what I mean. When the Prophet passed away in 631 or 632, he did not leave a successor. There were four people who succeed him, succeeded him in his temporal capacity. These were the Caliphs of Islam. The first one was Abu Bakr, the second one was Omar, the third one was Uthman, and the fourth one was Ali. Now, the majority of Muslims accepted those four individuals sequentially as the Caliphs of Islam. In the belief that when the Prophet died, the revelation ended. And these four individuals succeeded him as temporal rulers, political rulers of the Muslim community. But one little group said, yes, they were temporal leaders, but the fourth Caliph Ali, who was both a cousin and the son-in-law of the Prophet, was not only responsible for the political authority of the Muslim community as it was then, but was also responsible for guiding the faithful in the understanding of their faith. That means revelation comes to an end with the Prophet, but the need for spiritual guidance continues, and a small group followed the principles and the philosophy of Ali and they were known as the Shiatul Ali, party of Ali and that's how you get the division in Islam between the party of Ali called the Shias and the Sunnis. The Sunnis call themselves the people of the tradition, Ahlul Sunnah al Jamaa, the people of the tradition and the congregation. So if you take that as a broad dichotomy, Islam is divided into two branches, Sunnis, which is the majority, and Shias that are the minority. But they believe in the same Quran, they believe in the same Prophet, they believe in the final finality of the Prophet. Ismailis are a sub-branch of Shia Islam, but where we differ from other Shias is while the other Shias feel that there is an Imam but he is ghaib, he is in occultation, he will come back to rule the world. Ismailis say, no, we have a living Imam. He's known as Hazar Imam. Hazar, as you know in Urdu and Arabic and Persian, Hazar means present. And so we're one group from Shia Islam that follow the guidance of a living hereditary Imam who is His Highness the Aga Khan. He's the 49th hereditary Imam in direct descendant, lineal descent, from Ali, the son-in-law of the Prophet. Now, Ismailis as a community believe in a balance between faith and life. And the Imam of the time guides that process whereby the individual follower is able to balance his or her life by embracing the world, but also embracing the ethics of the faith. 
So the community today is spread in over 40 countries of the world. And the community is made up of different ethnicities. So there is a segment of the Ismailis today who are Gujaratis. I am a Gujarati Ismaili. So my heritage is Gujarati, my language is Gujarati, my food is Gujarati, the customs I follow are Gujarati. So I'm a Gujarati Ismaili. But over the last 40 years, with the breakdown of the Soviet Union, we came to realize that there are Persian Ismailis. You go to Tajikistan now, on the mountains of the Pamirs, there are Ismailis who have been Ismailis for a thousand years. They don't speak Gujarati, they don't eat Gujarati food, they don't have Gujarati customs, but they have Persian customs. Some of them have Zoroastrian customs. Then if you go to Syria today, you'll find Ismailis who are Arab. They don't speak Gujarati, but they are Arab Ismailis. And then in the diaspora, you have Ismailis today who are, are newborn children in the diaspora. Many of them are children of mixed marriages, biracial marriages. So if you go to Germany today, you may find somebody looking like Rolf and say, I'm an Ismaili. So the philosophy of Ismailism is universal, but its expression, like any other faith, is through a number of ethnicities. Now to go back to your question about Gujarat, how did the Gujaratis become Ismailis? If you look at Islam in India, at one time we were all Hindus. Islam came to India, I think, in the 9th century with Muhammad ibn Qasim. And so you have today what is Bangladesh, Pakistan, India. Originally the culture was Hinduism or Buddhism. But there were traders who came, there were Sufis who came, and who did trade, and then they converted people, or people converted to Islam. In our case, we were Hindus, we were Nuhanas. But the peers, the preachers, the teachers who came from Iran at the time, they came from Persia. They were Persian missionaries who came to India and embraced the Indian culture. They embraced the music of the continent. They embraced the languages of the continent. They dressed like Gujaratis. They lived among the people. But what they did is they, they bridged the ethical principles of Hinduism that all of us followed and said, look, there is the belief in one God which Islam teaches. But what you have with you and what is in the Quran is not at variance. It is teaching you how to be a good human being. So you could be culturally what you are and religiously accept the new faith. And that's how Islam came to India. It came through these processes. And then Muslims from that period, you remember, that the Omani trade routes that went from the monsoons from Calicut, Vasco da Gama in 1492, the trade routes in Africa. So when the Portuguese came to Africa in the 15th century, they had already found Gujarati traders on the coast of East Africa. There is a book written called The Periplus of the Erythrean Sea by a person called Hippalus. And Hippalus mentions in his book about Gujarati traders on the coast of East Africa. So you find the connections were very much on the Indian Ocean route. People didn't think of themselves at that time, I'm Hindu, I'm Muslim, this one is so. People all live, they traded together, culture had a greater interconnectivity and you know the Indian Ocean is a very 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 rich area if you really look at the Indian Ocean literal and if you think from Goa right up to Mozambique to Durban if you think of the last two three hundred years you are encompassing the Red Sea you are encompassing the, uh, the uh, Gulf of uh, the, uh, the Persian Gulf the Arabian Peninsula the Horn of Africa the East Coast right up to Cape. So you find that, and even then if you took it further, people went to the South China Seas, Malacca. So then you had different colonial groups like the Portuguese, the, the British, the French. So you find that colonialism, trade routes, the original Omani Empire, all of them coalesced to give the Indian Ocean this dynamism that we have today. 
which unfortunately in today's world where everybody's becoming so so sectarian and so xenophobic we are forgetting that culture is a very enriching experience culture knows no bounds music is music sports is sports people always interact and i think that is the richness that i think uh, we carry in our, our genes. So the Ismaili community in India became Muslims of the Shia branch about six, seven hundred years ago. But they today form one segment of the global Ismaili community, which is made up of Afghan Ismailis, Persian Ismailis, Arab Ismailis, Tajik Ismailis, uh, people from different parts of Africa, Bangladesh, India, Pakistan. So it's a global community made up of a number of ethnicities, different cultures, but they all follow the same philosophy with regard to their understanding of the faith. And we have a common religious leader who's the Aga Khan. And the Aga Khan sets up programs globally, which are not only for the community, but basically he runs one of the largest development organizations in the world, which is not for profit. We've talked about that sure. in a minute, but <clears throat> let me just uh, come back to your uh, personal education. Sure. Uh, give me a little bit uh, um, understanding of your uh, early education yeah. and then what you did later yeah. on in life. You know, I was, uh, as I told you, we were born in this little area, one mile away from one of the most modern capitals in the world. But we were born in an area where we had no sporting facilities. We had no library. We had no swimming pool. We had about 10 beds in a hospital that were allocated to us. So if more than 10 people fell ill, many of them could die. But I was very, very fortunate. What happened is that when I was about two years old, uh, in my book you will notice that there were a group of people from the community who felt that they wanted to start a little school because I had an uncle who was with the Theosophic Society in South Africa and he came across people who were educationists who spoke about the notion of what we today call early childhood education and he said that we want to start a little school so they started a little school behind the Jamaat Khana in Pretoria. Jamaat Khanna was where we congregated for prayers, but there was a room which was about the size of this hall here. And they got volunteers together and they put up a school and they employed a European governess, an African teacher and Indian teachers, women, who were volunteers. And they sent them for training in kindergarten, you know, kindergarten uh, uh, concepts. And so I was put in that school with my sisters and brothers. We were, it was a multiracial school, multi-faith. So I went to the Aga Khan Nursery School from 1940, maybe. I was there till 1951, so I must have been there for about three, four years. And then I went to the Pretoria Indian School in South Africa, in, ja in Maravishtat. So my junior school was in this little ghetto. Then my early secondary school was also at the Pretoria Boys High School. And then I went to Nairobi in Kenya, where in 1961, the Aga Khan had set up one of the finest schools in Nairobi, among the first few multiracial schools. And I was very fortunate to get into that school. And thereafter, I went to study in England, uh, where I became a lawyer at the Inns of Court. And then subsequently I went to Canada and I did law in Canada as well. And you've done a PhD at, at SOAS as well? Ah, yes, I did a doctorate much later in life. Mm -hmm. I, whatever, I worked for 30 years, 25 years. And uh, I asked His Highness whether I could go back to study and he was a great man for education. So he gave me the opportunity to do that. Okay. Why SOAS? Uh, I wanted to study uh, law from a cultural anthropology point of view. You know, I trained as a barrister. My first training in England taught me how to fight a case. So I was taught to be a fighter. My second training in Canada, which was necessary, taught me about jurisprudential thinking. So 
So I studied the history of law. In my later life, I wanted to say, does law really solve problems? And so I wanted to study law, but I wanted to study Islamic law. I wanted to know how Muslim law developed as a historical phenomenon. And the School of Oriental and African Studies is a very rich place in terms of culture, languages, music, art, literatures. And so uh, I found the causes that were being taught there were, were by some outstanding people. So unlike any other College of London University, SOAS had the concentration of the professors I wanted to be with. And so I gravitated to, uh, I had an opportunity to go to the London School of Economics as well, which is an outstanding university. But I spoke to a few professors and they said, look, if that is what you're looking for, if you're looking for the anthropological dimension of law and the cultural dimension, particularly with societies from third world countries, if you may, then SOAS would give you a better opportunity. So I ended up at SOAS, uh, fortunately. Can you tell us a bit about your early memories in Marabasta? Yes. Because that was the time during the apartheid yeah, era. Yeah. Just tell yeah. us a bit about that. You know, Marabasta was a happy place. You may ask me, well, how can you be so happy in a place like that? But you know, when you're children, you play. You play in the street. When it's raining, you get wet. When you're in the street, you're playing gilly danda, you're playing marbles. If it's Eid or Diwali, everybody's eating together, the sweetmeats, people are flying kites. So my childhood was a very happy childhood. Despite the difficulties that we had, that we didn't have facilities, I can say my childhood was very happy because of my family life. We had loving parents. And I'm one of 12 children, so we were always, the house door was always open. Somebody's walking in, somebody's walking out. So you, could, you had a, a, a brother or a sister who was one and a half years old, younger, and a brother or sister one and a half years older. So life was a lot of fun. But we, we, we didn't have facilities. What was a little difficult in terms of memory was when I saw apartheid in its crude form. It was painful. Not painful to me personally, but there were many occasions when I saw the police would chase an African man, a black man, because his registration papers were not in order. The humiliation that was imposed on that human being, as a human being, even though I was a very young kid, uh, pained me very much. And when I used to see that, I used to see somebody's father somebody's brother being humiliated that way. And, and, and that, that was difficult. At times it turned into violence. I saw an African man being beaten mercilessly once because he didn't have his papers. But there were other dimensions. We, we were in the cinema business. So I remember Africans in South Africa were very urbanized in those days. America was the great point of reference. So you'd find Africans who could sing like Nat King Cole. Uh, uh, remember being told, though I was too young, of Miriam Makeba coming to sing in our cinemas. The Miriam Makeba was to South Africa, what Lata Mangeshkar was to India, or, or Nana Maskuri was to Greece. So people like uh, Miriam Makeba, uh, in our early days, in 1951, uh, the American actor Sidney Poitier came to South Africa to make the film Cry the Beloved Country. And he visited our family, came to our cinema. Uh, people like Tyron Power came to South Africa, you know, we, family visited him. So there was a combination of different types of life that made our childhood in one way happy. Another way also we were aware that the color of our skin uh, would not allow us to go above a certain level of education or economic development you were condemned by the color of your skin. That means there's nothing you could do. Your brain was irrelevant. The color of your skin determined how far you would go in life. And we were conditioned to believe that. It took me about 30 or 40 years to get that out of my system. But it came out of my system without bitterness. I, never, I, I was angry earlier. But I came to realize that, that anger was probably 
misplaced. I had to forgive to be able to feel myself human again. Could you describe a little bit this, the atmosphere in Mara Bastard? Was there uh, a apartheid society in Mara Bastard? Yes, yes, I can talk about that. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Uh, maybe I should also mention that Marabishtar in microcosm was apartheid. So not only were we separated from the whites one mile away, but within Marabishtar there was one enclave where Indians lived. Then there was a road, just a road about the size of this room. And on the other side there were the Cullens. So Cullens were supposedly the product of white and black mixing. So coloreds would be in one enclave, we would be in another, and the third enclave would be the blacks. So within Marabastad there was apartheid. Between Marabastad and the city there was apartheid. And then as you went deeper into the city, then there would be white homes and white communes and white areas developed according to socio-economic status. But it was always better than the non-whites. So you find a white commune where even if poor whites were living, they would get facilities from the government to have decent homes, uh, you know, bathrooms, toilets, water solutions, schools, libraries. But we were deprived of that regardless of our economic status. Considering the, all the hardships which um, all uh, your your ancestors faced during their uh, arrival uh, in um, in South Africa, they seem to have um, adapted to the situation. And I don't know if it was a community network which they had, mm -hmm. which helped them, uh, you know, pull it together. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell us a bit about their early the early settlers' life and and how they adapted to the new country. Yeah, I think the Indian community had a great sense of solidarity. Though people lived among their own little groups, there was an overwhelming sense of closeness. That means the Tamil community lived among the Tamils. The Ismaili community lived among the Ismailis. The Hindu community had their own Seva Samaj. The Memon community had their own group. But there was a general feeling of closeness. And a feeling of closeness between Indians and Africans as well. Because if you look at Mr. Mandela's life story, Mr. Mandela, when he came to Johannesburg in 1945, stayed with two Indian lawyers, Ismail Mir and uh, I think it was a person called J.B. Singh, something Singh. Now, these two lawyers embraced him, took him in their little home, they were living in Joburg, and they used to eat together, they used to go to cinemas together. That's at the level of students. But if you also look at the level of trading, I recall as a little kid that though we did not have many facilities, there was always some Africans living in our home because they'd come from villages to come and buy groceries and, and, and products for their little retail shops. And my mother would cook for them, or my father would say, there's no hotels, where would they live? So they'd have a bed for them for the night. So there was that sort of things. There was resilience. I think people lived in community systems. I mean, as I grew up in South Africa, the word hotel never came in my mind. There was no such thing as a hotel because we couldn't stay in hotels. So anybody who came from anybody came to stay at our home. I mean, Ben Kingsley's grandfather must have stayed at one of our homes because where else would he have stayed? He was Indian from Zanzibar. So if he came to South Africa, he couldn't go into a European hotel. Then you may ask, were there no Indian hotels? For some reason, no, there weren't. So everybody stayed at people's homes. So this resilience was there. Number two, I think that community structures, in the case of the Ismaili community, for on which I can speak a lot, we had the Jamaat Khana, which was a place of congregation and prayer. But we had the nursery school there. Uh, the community had a clinic that they set up. So our parents could go to see doctors there. We got some outstanding doctors to come and see women about maternal and child health care. When we were born, our parents would take us to the nursery school. I've got some photos I'll show you. I'm a little kid, only one year old, but an aunt is holding me. And there are two volunteers from the community who are looking at everybody's health checks and so on. So I think community structures helped a lot. And this is what Mahatma Gandhi saw when he came there. Because Gandhi was able to 
tap onto the community uh, reservoir of goodwill, hospitality and help. People generally lived in their own inner community groups. So there was a South African Indian community, but you had a Tamil group, you had an Arya Samaji group, you had the Gujaratis, you had the Memons who were Sunni Muslims, you have the Ismailis who were Shia Muslims. Generally people had their own community institutions, but there was a, overall there was a great community spirit. So for example, if there was a big wedding in a Hindu community and they wanted to put up a big tent for the ceremony, then they may go to the neighbors and say, look, we want some chairs and we want to do this, would it be okay? There was a general feeling of closeness. And I think that anyone who I think who promoted that to a large extent was uh, Gandhiji, Mahatma Gandhi. Because when Gandhi came, and we'll talk about that in a minute, when he started his school in 1910 at Tolstoy Farm, he had Indian Christian children, he had Ismaili children, Ismaili Muslims, he had Sunni Muslim kids, he had Parsis, he had Christians, he had Tamils, and he was teaching with a German friend, an architect who was Jewish, Hermann Kallenbach. So Kallenbach, a German Jew, and Gandhi, an Indian Hindu, teaching children from all these communities, so their parents would meet. And so Gandhi was a great contributor towards that feeling of solidarity, as it were. So li literally, he brought unified. Um, uh, the, I think the so. Yes. 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 Um, tell us a bit about the role played by him in the evolution of African political well, consciousness. I think it's remarkable. It is absolutely remarkable. I think that while uh, a great deal is written of Mahatma Gandhi's life, uh, I am. Uh, I think a lot more needs to be pulled out about the seminality of his contribution to political consciousness, not only in Africa, but beyond Africa to India and the globe. Now I'll tell you what I mean by that. First of all, Gandhi started a school in 1910 that I just mentioned a minute ago at Tolstoy Farm. You know, he was inspired by the philosophy of Ruskin, was English, John Ruskin, of Thoreau, who was American, and of Tomstro, who was a Russian. Now here's a Gujarati lawyer in the early part of the century who's imbibing the philosophy of Thoreau, Ruskin and Tomstro. But he also has a scriptural connection. He reads the Bible, he's read the Gita, he reads the Quran. So basically Gandhi is a universalist and he's got this experiment in a school for cosmopolitan ethics. What we call today cosmopolitan ethics is what he was practicing. So that's at one level. The second level is that in 1910 when his discussions with the liberal government of Campbell Bannerman didn't work and South Africa got its union position, Gandhi did not wallow in self-grievance. On the way back to South Africa, he wrote the Hind Swaraj. And the Hind Swaraj became the blueprint for India's independence. Thirdly, while it can be argued that Gandhi did not succeed in South Africa, if one is cynical, they'll say, well, what did Gandhi gain? Apartheid took greater force after he left. But if you really look at what Gandhi, what, what foundation Gandhi laid, was that the internationalization of apartheid and the germination of the thought of human rights in 1946, the case that Gandhi championed at the United Nations, was one of the cornerstones of the African freedom movement of nonviolence. Kenneth Kaunda, Julius Nyerere, Kwame Nkrumah, all of them said we are following the Gandhian philosophy. And it's ironical that a man Gandhi never met was inspired so much by his philosophy that the American civil rights movement was a Gandhian movement. Martin Luther King said, I was looking for a 
a true Christian and I found him in Mahatma Gandhi. So if you look at Gandhi's overall philosophy at one level and the political consciousness that he created, I mean Gandhi taught the South Africans the whole notion of mobilization of politics. If it wasn't for Gandhi, those freedom movements wouldn't have taken place. And it was the Gandhian philosophy eventually that inspired Mandela when he came out of prison to forgive and to reconstitute a new South Africa. To a very large extent, Mandela was inspired by Gandhi. And if you take just before Mandela, one of the great stalwarts of the South African freedom movement was a person called Yusuf Dadu. Dr. Yusuf Dadu was a Gujarati Muslim from Surat. And Dadu, if it wasn't for Dadu, the pact between the Africans and Indians to fight apartheid would have never taken place. Because Dr. Dadu was trained at Edinburgh University, went back to South Africa in the 1930s, and he was inspired by the philosophy of Mahatma Gandhi. So Gandhi's philosophy in the political consciousness of the African freedom movement permeated the entire 20th century. And not only that, it flowed into the American civil rights movement. So you could see how seminal his contribution is. Now, if you look at India, and people say, well, when India's partition took place, 14 million people were displaced, 1 million people died. You can't blame Gandhi for that, because Gandhi stood for a principle. It was despite that principle that the damage took place. But I think when people look at Gandhi in a very, very narrow prism, because he fought for the Indians against the South African government, I think they are overlooking the greater universal values for which he lived, for which he fought, and which he was able to inspire others. I think that dimension needs to be pulled out, which in a very humble and very small way my book may try to do. I cannot take more credit for that. But I think if you go to South Africa today, not many people know that the role he played in the Transvaal. And when I went there recently for my book launch about eight months ago, I actually went to the point where he would receive his ride. Whenever he was looking for a ride, I stood in the corner and I said, this is the corner where Gandhiji used to meet my grand uncle. And then I went to the Hamida Mosque in Johannesburg. And I stood at the place where he burnt all the certificates. He made a bonfire. He took one of these big pots and he said, take your registration certificates, put them in. And he lit the place. He burnt it. Now, that wasn't a lawless Gandhi. That was a principal Gandhi because he was negotiating all the time. And when negotiations failed, he said, we'll burn our certificates. We want to be law-abiding, but if you don't accept who we are, we have no choice. So to answer your question, I think that larger dimension of Gandhiji's work needs to be pulled out. And I think there are people doing that. I recently met an author called Fakir Hassan in South Africa, who did a book called Thousand and One Inspirations or something like that. And he's captured the anecdotes of all these families who knew Gandhi. And it's very interesting. One man brought a ballot as an artifact of Gandhi's. And they said, well, where's this belt from? It was the belt of the South African police force. The policeman was trying to hit Gandhi and with this belt. And this Indian man took the belt away from the policeman. But he hid it away because they thought if he, they ever find him with the belt, the apartheid state would, would prosecute him. So almost 100 years later, he brought the belt and he said, this is what I've kept in my family for almost 100 years because my grandfather saved Gandhi because that was the belt that the police was hitting him with. So those type of anecdotes are, 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 are what, what we're beginning to lose. We need to capture them. I interviewed Mani Ben Nana Sita. And Mani Ben is about 92 years old. And she came to my book launch. And she said, my father never ate meat 
because he was a little boy and he was just watching Gandhi in the last days of his discussions and negotiations. Smart, smart. And till the day Nana Sita died, he did not submit to the government's rule to pull him out of his home because of the color of his skin. He said, I'll die in my house. You'll have to pull me out and put me in the street. So they took him out and they threw him into the streets. And then they put him into prison. He said, I will go to prison, but I will not submit to illegality. So I think that these are the anecdotes of people through which that dimension of Gandhi can be given a new dimension of life. If I may also add one more thing, uh, <clears throat> I was just reading that this morning, funny, on the train, from a 1932 newspaper, that when Sarojini Naidu came to South Africa, she came to Maradistat on the 7th of January 1932, and she said, I was in England, wanted to go back to India, and Gandhi said, go to South Africa and help the Indians there. He said, it was Gandhi that has made me come here today. That she was then a member of the round table conference that was held in South Africa in 1932, which was the second round table conference that she came to. And she said, Gandhi has such a feeling about what he gained here and what he did, that he could not forget the people in this part of the world. So I'm here because of him. And then 1946, when Vijay Lakshmi Pandit led the case of the United Nations, that's Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru's sister, again Gandhi was the inspiration behind that whole process. And the chief jurist of that whole case was again in Gujarati, Mamdali Karim Chagra. So in, in some way South Africa um, influenced Gandhiji in, 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 in in, in, in a big way. big way. And you quite rightly say that India gave South Africa a lawyer in South yeah. Africa. He, gave it the he came out as a Mahatma. Yeah. So um, that, that was quite, quite uh, well written. <laughs> Let's talk a bit about your journey from South Africa to Kenya. Yeah. Uh, can I, can I, can I ask you? Uh, you were talking about uh, the connection of different families to Mahatma Gandhi. Yes. Was there a connection to your family as well? I yes, think? yes. My connection to the family, there is a letter in my book in which I'll also show it to you too, if you want to film it. Uh, our connection to Gandhi, it was at two levels. One level was in 1910, when he started Tolstoy Farm, he came to my grand-uncle, Valshi Kishabji, and he said to Valshi, he said, I need children from business families because I'm running the school for the children of those people who are in prison. So they have no fees. So I need to run the school. He said, send this little boy to my school. His name was Rajabali. And my grand uncle said, no, I don't want to send him, he's too young. I think he was about eight years old. He said, I want to teach him the principles of our tariqa of Islam and all that. And Gandhi said, look, what language is that in? He said, in Gujarati. He said, well, I know Gujarati. He said, give me the book, I'll, I'll teach you. So my uncle felt very comfortable. He said, please, if you can do that, take him. So our connection with Gandhi in 1910 was through the school and through my uncle. And so Gandhi, I've checked in the collected works, I believe there are 23 references of letters between my granduncle and him. The second connection came in 1914, when C.F. Andrews came to South Africa. C.F. Andrews was the secretary to Gandhi, who I think Gokhale had sent to work with Gandhi in the negotiations with Smuts at the latter end of Gandhi's period in South Africa. And Andrew stayed at our home. I have oral history to say that they would come to Marabistan because there was no hotels. Gandhi used to come from Joburg. Andrews came from outside. The Andrews may have stayed with the, uh, the Church of Scotland Mission or whatever church it is. 
but he had to spend a lot of time drafting the memorandums and all that. And that's the time they used our conveyance to go to the union buildings. So those are the two points in which our family had connections with Gandhi. But there were many other families, like the Kachalia family, very prominent family. Muhammad Ahmed Kachalia was Gandhi's client. And Gandhi and he also, when the certificates were burnt, Kachalia was there. There was the Tambi Naidu family. Five generations of this family's members participated in the fight against apartheid. So there were many families like that in Durban and in Pretoria who remember Gandhi as a lawyer or the Tolstoy Farm School or the Phoenix Farm where Gandhi was running a printing press or families who went to prison with him or families that marched with him. So there were, there were many, many families who, the Sorabji family, for example, they are Parsis of Gujarati background. Well, Sorabji's home was where Gandhi stayed when he first came uh, to Durban. When he was beaten up in the first occasion, then Sorabji took him home. So you find that there are still families who either have a direct understanding of what Gandhi did or certain memories that were given to them. You might just mention the Tolstoy farm. Can you explain yes, yes. What, what was this? Apparently, uh, when Gandhi came to the Transvaal and he was fighting against the unjust laws, a group of Indians followed him. They were not Gujaratis. They were largely Tamils. And that was the family of Tambi Naidu. One of the family members is a high court judge here called Deva Pale. Deva's mother was in that group as well. And he's is an adventure of Middle Temple Inn, interestingly enough. And so what happened is that Gandhi was looking for a commune because he was communicating at the time with Tolstoy. Tolstoy and Gandhi used to write to each other. And he wanted to put Tolstoy's philosophy of a commune where people abjured westernization or technology but produced their own sandals, produced their own food, protected the environment. Children were taught not to kill, but to eat vegetables and all that. So Gandhi wanted this experiment type of school for two reasons. One, he wanted to put this to, to, to work. And they found a place 20 kilometers from Johannesburg in a place called Lawley, L-A-W-L-E-Y, where Kallenbach had a farm with thousand fruit trees and Kallenbach gave them this place to say why don't we come there and build a little shed and a little school. So they got a Gujarati, a Hindu Gujarati carpenter and the carpenter's name is in my book I think. The carpenter built this place as a volunteer and they set up this makeshift shift school. Then Gandhi went to all these people, including my granduncle, and said, send your children. So people started sending the children because they thought, as an Indian community, yeah, we want our kids to learn values, we want them to learn. And Gandhi was very fair. He said, I will not uh, interfere with their religious life. I will teach them your particular understanding of the faith. I will teach it. And he did this with a great degree of honesty, sincerity, and balance. And I think that's what the trust people had in him. My granduncle never felt a moment of worry. I mean, this is incredible that a Muslim could say, yes, my kid, he's too young, I don't want to send him. But if you are in charge, I have no worry. And I think everybody felt that way. I mean, if you talk to the families of those people, all of them speak of Gandhi with deep, deep sense of love, respect, uh, almost veneration because they realized that the man stood for a principle, he stood for a philosophy, he stood for a respect of universality. You know? mm. uh, just, just one, you mentioned Kallenbach, what yeah. was his role? He donated the place, isn't it? Yeah, Kallenbach, not only did he donate the place, but Kallenbach taught, he was an architect in Johannesburg, and Kallenbach actually taught the philosophy of Tolstoy. And Kallenbach went to the Trappist Monastery, I think in the Cape or Durban. He learned how to make sandals. 
and he came back and he taught the children how to make their own sandals. So the kids had to make their own sandals, make their own clothing. Now very, very interesting. If you go to Pretoria in South Africa, go to the Transvaal Museum, you will see a glass case there with a pair of sandals that belonged to General Smuts, the Prime Minister. And you know who made that? Gandhi made those sandals in prison. When Gandhi was in prison, he made a pair of sandals which he sent to Smuts as a gift. And those, that, those sandals are in that glass case. <laughs> and that was all learned from the trap monastery at Tolstoy Farm. Okay. Very interesting. Okay, let's uh, talk about your journey to Kenya yeah. and, and its influences and also tell us a bit about the contribution made by Gujaratis in the East sure. Africa yeah. culture, professional life, politics, business. Yeah. 1962 was when I came to Kenya. We came to Kenya largely because we had part of our family in Nairobi. We had an uncle there who was there for 10 years already because he left in 1952. My father left in 62 and other cousins left in 72 and 82. For some reason these 10 year cycles. We came to Kenya because Kenya was just becoming decolonized. It's a very interesting dynamic I see in our lives that we were leaving the country when one man was going to prison who was going to become a future president. We were coming to another country where a person was coming out of prison to become the president of the country. So Kenyatta was coming out of prison and Mandela was going into prison. So Kenya was the most logical place for us to go because I had a sister who was married in Kenya and she kept on telling our parents, come along, my in-laws and my husband will be very happy to you know, help you settle. And we were 12 children. And my mother wanted us all to go to university. I mean, my mother was a very ambitious Gujarati woman. All of us didn't go to university, but she was very, very bent on ensuring that none of us would be deprived, regardless of the political situation. And so we came to Nairobi. But Kenya was very exciting because don't forget, 1960, 61, 62, that was the time Kenyatta was just being released. Wind of change. There was a new blossoming of a new spirit of independence. And you saw that the Indian community in Kenya was playing a role, particularly the big pharmacists, the doctors, the lawyers, they were all Indians. The Indians had contributed to the development of political consciousness earlier. Now you're talking about the Gujarati contribution. Well, Jivanji was a great political figure in the 1940s and 1920s. Jivanji, the Zarina Patel's grandfather. Suleiman Virji, Hussein Suleiman Virji, was a great Gujarati Ismaili Indian politician. These were the people who fought the British to ensure that Kenya did not become like Rhodesia. They fought in the 20s, in the 30s. Then one of the big men in Kenya's politics who came to the Lancaster House Conference was Ibrahim Natu. Ibrahim Natu was colonial minister of works. When Natu came back to Kenya, he said, we will vote for the Africans to precipitate independence. He was a Gujarati. Then if you look at the early year development when Upper Punt came to, South, uh, to Kenya in the 1950s, there were people like Desai, there were people like Suryakan Patel, and there were many Gujaratis who participated and contributed to the whole political process. Of course, Kenyatta's lawyer, main lawyer was a Punjabi, Achur Kapila. His second main man on the team was Jasmin Singh. Indians. The third one was at Goa, Fritz de Souza. So Kenyatta's defense team was made up of Indian lawyers. There were also African lawyers. H.O. Davis came from Nigeria. Dudley Thompson came from Jamaica. D.N. Pritt came from England. But there was a sizable Indian segment in Kenyatta's defense team. And the Africans remembered at the time. They remembered Pant. They remembered the Indian contribution. 
But the Indian contribution was also at a different level. The Indian contribution was at the level of the economy, the shops they had put, all the corner shops, which became a problem later on. But the Indians were known as people who were dukawalas. The, the, the Indian shop would be open till 11, 12, 1, 2 in the morning. You got your kerosene, you got your milli meal, you got your, your matches, you got your candlesticks, you got your bread, you got your milk. So that's number one. Number two, at the larger level of economic development in East Africa, not so much in Kenya but in Uganda, the two biggest industrialists, if not three, Mulji by Madwani, Gujaratis, Nanji Kalinas Mehta, Gujaratis, big time businessmen, I think they were producing about 70 to 72 products, from margarine to glass to cardboard boxes to bulbs to light your home up. Sugar, Sugar and everything. You had the Hindochas who were in Kisumu, the, the Mivani sugar mill people. Then you had in Nairobi, you have a large Gujarati traders. Uh, Kanji Naranji is a large property owner. If you went to Bazaar Street, most of the Nairobi Bazaar Street business people were all Gujaratis. So you'd find shop fronts that look very simple. These chaps would probably wear a dhoti or they wear a wear lungi or something, but they could write you a check for a million pounds. You know, within, uh, they'd sign a check at 10 o'clock in the morning, it would be paid by 12. It was that type of dimension. Eventually, the Indians got into difficulty because they were seen only as that. The difficulty that came up in East Africa, as I see it, is that the Indian political contribution was undermined and the Indians were looked at only as business people. In which case, after independence, the African narrative was that you people have been here too long, you are blocking our economic development. You have done nothing. The Indians didn't have the voice to tell them that this was only part of our contribution. So the Indian voice was emasculated by the fact that they were a very small minority. Number two, the political structures did not allow them a voice. And thirdly, African nationalism became too strong a force post-independence in wanting to restructure the society without any respect, if I may put it that way, to the notion of pluralism and diversity. What happened is that when the colonials left, the African narrative was, the British have left, what are you doing here? And that was Uganda, that's what India means said, go to India, what are you doing here? Go to Britain. And the British said, no, you're not part of us, you should have taken independence. Your passports we gave you are devalued, they are de-passports. India said, look, we will not get involved. If people turned up at our doorsteps, we'll take them. But it's a British problem, or it's an African problem. And Idi Amin said, no, you can't stay here because even if you took citizenship, there's a technical hitch, your citizenship is not valid. So the Indians became like stepchildren. It is at that point in time that the Canadian government, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, took a lot of people in. Britain slowly took who they refused. But if you look at 1972, Indians were like stepchildren. Nobody wanted them. On the... I think it was 11th November 1860, the first two boats arrived, the SS Truro and the SS Belvedere. They were two ships that brought indentured laborers from India. There were many, I think, from the South India part, many from Bihar. They were the first group of people who came as laborers to work on the sugar plantations. Because the South African government at that time found that they needed workers on the sugar plantations. And the Zulus, the black population, the Zulus, were not ready to work there. Historically, it says that they got laborers from uh, China earlier, and they got laborers from certain parts of Asia, but they didn't work out. So India was the next catchment area. And people were hoodwinked into coming there on the basis that said, after five years, you'll be free, you'll be able to own property, you can start business, you'll be free Indians. After your indenture is over, 
you can remain in the country. So people on the left and thought, hey, this is great. Bingo. Who it's brought that? The British government. The British authorities in South Africa, because Natal was a British colony. Remember South Africa before the Union? The Cape Province and Natal were under the British, and the Transvaal and Orange State were under the Dutch. There were two colonial powers that owned these four states, these four provinces. So the British in South Africa that were running the colony of Natal spoke to the British in India to send Indian laborers, what they eventually said, coolie laborers, they were coolies. That was the word they used, to come and work in the plantations. But when these people came, the plantations was not normal work. They were, they were treated like slaves. They were beaten up, women were raped, uh, people were killed. If you ch change your, your indenture, you got beaten up. So you were enslaved. Eventually, when those people became free, the Natal government said, you can't stay, now go back. But they said, we came here for five years, we were told we'll be free. They said, no, there's nothing sort. You go back again. Now, that was in 1860. That whole case only got fought when Gandhi came in 1894. Their whole case got a shape 34 years later. But between 1860 and 1870, indentured laborers got me. In 1870, the new situation required small business people. So now the catchment area is no longer Bihar or South India. It becomes Gujarat because Gujarat was pushing people out because of the drought and famine and South Africa was sucking them in. So now you get a new group of immigrants who are largely Muslims from Gujarat, the Surtis, Memons from Gujarat, Ismailis, Parsis, some of the Hindus, Patels and Shahs, Jains. So you get a different type of group of people who were much more linked to India. The earlier group lost its connection with India because they went into the plantations, very much like Guyana, Fiji. So they lost contact with India. The second group had contact with India. This is why in my book you'll see in 1923, my grandmother goes to India to find two girls from Gujarat to marry my uncles. They were brought up in South Africa, but she had to take them to India to get married. Whereas the 1860 people didn't go to India, they married local, they married local Indian indentured laborers. So today when you go to South Africa, you see a cleavage in the Indian community. Very, very distinct, which I didn't know. You go to Johannesburg, go to Transvaal, Go everywhere there, you will see the children of passenger Indians. They are basically business people. Go to Natal, certain parts of those groups are now professionals, but a large part of those groups are also children of indentured laborers. They do not have family structures, they do not have business uh, situations, and some of them are gangs, they are in gangs, they, 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 they're gangsters. So you can see a cleavage in the Indian community which is not homogeneous, unlike East Africa. So you will find a broad cleavage between the children of indentured South Africans, who many of them now have got out of that problem and become professionals in Natal. And largely, the children of the Gujarati immigrants who are in business, they are big business people, they, are not prof they have become professionals, but they are not practicing their professions. The Gujarati accountants, they become doctors, they become lawyers, but they're also business people. The indentured people's children are not in business. They are either professionals or they didn't make it. There's a large group that are poor Indians. And I was amazed that the first time I went to Durban, I saw the doorkeeper was an Indian. When I went to eat food, the waitress was an Indian girl. And I told my wife, are, are we sure we are in Africa? Because to me, Indians were business people. Indian girls never were waitresses. Indian guys were not running taxis. But I saw it in Natal. So that is the cleavage between the indentured and the passenger. And interestingly enough, the indentured laborers gave their body to the fight. 
the passenger engines gave them mobilizational techniques. So the first person to draft the constitution of South Africa, one of the leading people, Ismail Mahmoud, is a Gujarati Muslim. The man who is Mandela's lawyer, Ismail Ayu, is a Gujarati Muslim. But if you find those people who went to prison, people like Inglis Naidu, he was, he was not indentured, but he came from the Tamil community. But a lot of people from that background actually fought against apartheid at the ground level. So you do see that nuance in the Indian community in South Africa. Have I answered you? Thank you so much, Bob. Very nice. Uh, right to something on a lighter note. You mentioned the cinema business. Yes. What was, what was this? Oh, lovely. <laughs> That's my great one. I love that. Uh, our family were not the pioneers of the cinema business in Maravishtat. But by the 1930, they got the monopoly for some reason. <laughs> That's your Gujarati business people. The cinema business was started in Maravishtat by a Muslim community known as the Kanamiyas. There was a man called Sheikh Ahmed who started a cinema called the Bombay Star Cinema. It was called the Bombay Star Biscope. It was in the corner of the Main Street, Boom and Jerusalem Street, opposite, diagonally opposite to the nursery school I went to. But in the 1930s, 1927, my father's two brothers and my father's brother-in-law decided that they were going to start a cinema called the Royal Kinema, K-I-N-E-M-A. It wasn't cinema, it was called Kinema. And they decided to set up this place called a bioscope in which they showed films. And 1927 is an important time. Al Jolson, the silent movies were going out. And Al Jolson said, hey, you ain't seen anything yet. He was talking about the great cinema revolution that was coming in. So from 1927, 28 till 1960s, in the Marabishtat area, it was largely our family, or our community, that ran the three major cinemas. We ran two of them. One belonged to the Tamil community, the Chetty brothers. But eventually, the Chetty brothers bought us out. So what did that do? We ran the cinemas in Marabishtat because Africans had no cinemas. They didn't have their own cinemas. They couldn't go to white cinemas. So the only place that the African had for recreation and his or her exposure to the world was the cinemas that we were running. And so the cinemas we were running showed Metro Golden Mayor films, United Artists, 20th Century Fox. So all the top films that were coming out, you know, Douglas Fairbanks, in the early days called Douglas, Time and Power, uh, Roy Rogers, uh, Tex Ritter, you know, Tom Mix, the great film uh, uh, actresses, you know, Greta Garbo, uh, people like Mary Pickford, Charlie Chaplin, and later on Eva Gardner, uh, Sid Cherise, uh, Elizabeth Taylor. So we used to get all those films, but not the first run. The non-whites got the second run. That means if a top film starts, it has to be seen in the European cinemas first. After it's finished its run in the European cinemas, to which non-whites cannot go, it comes to the non-white cinemas. So our cinemas were where these films used to be showing. Now besides contributing to the entertainment of the people, the cinemas had a social purpose. Because that is where our family gave the cinemas for social purposes. So if there's a school prize giving day, they said we can't accommodate all the children, parents, can we use the cinema hall? So the cinema halls are where plays were held, where prize giving ceremonies took place. The Empire Cinema, which belonged to my uncle in Maravishtat, was where a young girl who was the daughter of a washerwoman used to come to sing. My uncle used to give her five pounds as a gift on a Friday evening. That was a woman called Miriam McKenna. So Miriam McKeever used to come and sing there. So our cinemas became the centers A for social purpose, educational purposes, giving the space to African talent from the townships who wanted to sing. 
So Miriam Makeba used to come with the Manhattan brothers and eventually, you know, they became part of the King Kong. Remember the King Kong that went all over? Miriam Makeba was the main singer. Sidney Poitier came there in 1951. He spoke from the cinema. So the cinema had that purpose. The third purpose was the cinema became a place for political meetings. When Dr. Dadu came there, they came to the cinema to speak. So the cinema was multi-purposeful. At one level, it was for entertainment and earning some money. At another level, it was a social purpose. And uh, in the cinema business, we also faced apartheid because we couldn't show films where a white actor was kissing a black woman or a black actor was kissing a white woman. Because if there was a film that came out of America and if there was a scene like that, you had to cut the film. And if you didn't cut the film and showed it, then you would be in, uh, in some one of the 148 laws of apartheid, you'd be caught for doing something wrong. So every day the police would come into the cinema and say, show us what you showed. What film did you see? Somebody may go and spy to the police that they showed us the scene. Now, if there was a scene that the white government didn't want you to see of the white people, for example, there may be a American woman dancing in very flimsy clothes and the African government would say, you know, our puritanical culture shows that you can't show that type of thing. It's against our morals. You should have cut it. So in a film, you don't know how much to cut. You cut so much, there'll be no film left. So these are the type of realities we faced every day. When the cinema was out, Africans would come out, there would be the police to catch them for their pass. Immediately they come out, there's a big truck. They'll go from the cinema into the truck to the, to the prisons. So that would be another blockage. The third blockage is that we could not trade. You can't trade in black areas. So if you're trading black areas, you get only a two-hour opening. So my uncle was in the cinema. One of my uncles was in the baking business. Africans need bread before they go to work. They wouldn't give him a permit to enter the locations until nine o'clock. When he goes in nine, at nine o'clock, the, the bread vans go at nine o'clock. All the white bread vans have gone in and sold their bread. When he goes at nine o'clock, the, the, the workers have left. So every day there was some bottleneck in our life. But we, we had to survive, we had no choice. That was our life. We laughed about it, but at the end of the day, we had to, we had to survive. Okay, have I come mm. there? Fantastic. Uh, it just leads me to the next question yeah. regarding the languages. Mm. You were talking about American films. So, so can you yes. English. elaborate on the languages you spoke in your area? Yeah. Well, we spoke, my parents were born in South Africa. My father always wanted us to know Gujarati, but you know, when you brought up in Pretoria, you know, you're very far away from India. We had, we had all these American films, American movies is what we saw every day. So English was taught in schools, Afrikaans was taught in schools, but we went to an English language school. You either went to an Afrikaans language school or an English language school. By and large, the Indians had their own English language schools. So Afrikaans was us, not only was it the foreign language, we never learned it. I failed it, you know, consistently. But in our Marabashtad, there was every African language you can think of. Shangan, Venda, Koza, Zulu, Sutu, uh, every language. Then there were Indian languages, there was Urdu, there was Hindi, there was Gujarati, uh, there was Bengali, there was Arabic, there was Afrikaans. Uh, so, uh, th there was a melange of languages because there's a melange of people. We never categorized the people as I'm telling you now. To us, they were all people, we saw each other. Today, I'm saying, oh my God, this is a mini United Nations in this small area. But that was the nature of the demographics. But we all were the same in the face of the struggle we had. So, languages abounded. There were many different languages. And there were different churches in the area. There'd be a church, there'd be a Jamaat Khana, there'd be a masjid down the road, there would be a uh, Hindu temple. So the road I was born in and all the churches there. I should be the most religious man on earth because there were five churches or five places of worship in my road. But there was a cinema right near my house. So there was a good balance between the world and faith, you know. So it was fun. What was the lingua franca between you? 
uh, with us we all spoke in English as kids. Uh, with the Khalids we spoke a little Afrikaans because their main language is Afrikaans, not English. So one road away, the whole enclave were Afrikaans speaking. Within the Asiatic Bazaar it was mainly English. If you spoke to uh, Parsotambai or M.M. Joshi, you spoke in Gujarati because it's all the people. You spoke to them in Gujarati. I didn't speak Urdu, but most of the uh, Memon community may speak Gujarati or some of them may speak Urdu. They spoke mainly Kutch or they speak Gujarati because Memons are Sunni Muslims, but they, their language is either Kutch or Gujarati. So people spoke with their own communities in different dialects. The Tamil community taught their children every day Tamil. So I used to hear Tamil alphabet, I don't know what it meant, but about 200 kids were reciting it all together in road, right across the road from where I lived. So you found that each community tried to maintain their cultural uh, connections through language, through religion, through religious formation, through culture. And then one of the three cinemas, called the Orient Cinema, on Tuesday night used to show Tamil films, and I think on Thursday they used to show a Hindi movie. So while you had Clark Gable and Tyron Power and Robert Taylor and Gene Simmons, you had Raj Kapoor and you had Nargis and you had Madhubala and you had the old Indian. So Indians had their own hero or heroines depending which cinema they went to. So it was a sort of a melange, but it was a very strongly westernizing context. We had to hold on to our culture, it didn't come automatically. But in some ways you were quite influenced by uh, the English literature, uh, Shakespeare and... Very much so, because I think at schools we had good teachers. Our teachers were European teachers, Dutch and English. And don't forget South Africa was a colony of, to a large extent, South Africa was under British influence. So, in our English uh, language school, we were not exposed to Afrikaans literature, which is a tragedy because there's a very rich Afrikaans literature that we were, which was marginal to us. But yes, uh, we had to do one Shakespeare in school. Uh, Romeo and Juliet is what I did. I was doing King Lear when I left. So yeah, we were in Marabistat. But we were, uh, we heard about Shakespeare, we knew about Robert Browning. Uh, I got more of that when I came to Kenya, because Kenya was a pure British colony. But in South Africa, yes, uh, our earliest uh, influences were, were very much uh, Shakespeare, Browning, uh, uh, Yeats, uh, you know, Jane Austen, Coleridge. That was part of our upbringing. We had to do literature, we had to study. And what about uh, Tagore and... Uh... No, that we didn't have. That I picked up through my own uh, journey. That is the sad part. When I, when I look at our education in those days, this is not a criticism, it's a critique. That I feel very enriched that I can appreciate Shakespeare. I can enjoy Yeats. I can enjoy Jane Austen, it tells me about the social life of Britain in the 19th century, the Victorian period. But the beautiful poetry of Rabindranath Tagore, it came to me by accident in Canada when I was in my 30s. I knew that there was an Indian who won the Nobel Prize in 1913 for literature, but nobody told me about Tagore's short stories, his beautiful prose his poetry, his music, his art. Now this is only Tagore. What about the speeches of Jawaharlal Nehru? What about the Gujarati poetry of Narsim Mehta, for example? What about the poetry of Sarojini Naidu? Sarojini Naidu was a poetess. What about the philosophy of Mahatma Gandhi? What about the work of Mother Teresa? You know, there was so much richness of the Indian culture that was denied to us because it was not taught. We had no cultural facilities, we had no libraries, we had no real connection with India. Our connection with India was through the food we had or some of the Indian Bollywood type of movies. It was not even called Bollywood then. So it was that type of connection. And so colonial education either made you a self-hating Indian 
and a mimicry, a mimic Englishman, or it made you totally Indian and you, you rejected the West. And I think that my experience has taught me that you could be a bridge between both. Because good literature is good literature. Shakespeare didn't talk to Indians or Talads or whites. Shakespeare spoke to the human condition. And so did uh, Schiller, if you take, or, or Nietzsche, Kant, Kierkegaard, or great philosophers of the East, spoke to the human condition. I mean, Dr. Rale Krishnan uh, spoke to the human condition. Similarly, Rale Krishnan, the great philosopher. So I think that dimension of education, unfortunately, was not built into the colonial system. And I think that that was a, a sadness. Let's talk about your journey to yeah. Britain now. Yeah. Um, tell us, uh, you, you, you came uh, to England in the 1960s. 67, yeah. 67, yeah. Uh, your early experiences. And yes. Talk about that. I was very fortunate that uh, I went to one of the oldest law schools in England. I found that uh, I gained admission to Gray's Inn, one of the four law schools in Britain, Lincoln's Inn, Inner Temple, Middle Temple and Gray's Inn were the four schools of law where you became a barrister. And I wanted to go to Gray's because I thought it was a very chic place to be in and they needed Latin so I had a little bit of Latin from South Africa and they accepted me. So I was very fortunate to gain admission into a law school that was very a very good law school. All the four schools are very prominent. They, they constitute a body. But Grazing is supposed to be, supposed to be one of the, the lovely ones to be at. But when I came, I had a glorious idea that it's going to be like a university in America where you go in with your jeans and sit down. And it wasn't that. It was a very formal place, extremely formal. It was lonely. I was alone. I was in this particular place, I remember the first day I walked in with a fair isle jersey with all these dazzling pictures on it, suede boots and walked in with a girlfriend I had met and we were just walking around and making a noise and the under treasurer sent a man with a purple robe <laughs> and he did a big stick like, like, a, like a cross and he said, are you a student here? I said, yeah. He said, you don't dress appropriately. So I thought to myself, my God, what have I come to? So it's a very formal place because it's a formal guild. It produced authors and produced attorney generals and prime ministers in the past. And here was a guy from the colonies walking in and treating it like a high school canteen. So it was lonely. Uh, there were not many Indians in Britain at that time. 1967, I mean, uh, Indians are very, very few, uh, few and far between. Uh, if you found an Indian restaurant, it was one of uh, one, one in a whole area, as opposed to everybody. I went last night to a place in uh, Tooting Broadway. I was at the Lahori Krai house last night at around 10 o'clock and I didn't find one Indian person in the restaurant. They were all whites. They were having a party and I thought to myself, you know, 40 years ago, you'd never see this. You'd know, never see this. So it was very lonely. It was a very posh school that people came in from Harrow or Eton. They went to a top public school like Winchester or King's Canterbury and then they'd go to Oxford and Cambridge and they'd arrive at Gray's Inn. Now I came from Manabistan. <laughs> I was in a school under Jacaranda Tree at one time. <laughs> then I went through the Aga Khan school in Nairobi, which was three years, very posh school. So my trajectory was not similar to the guys I was sitting with. They started talking things I couldn't even understand. So it was a new world. But I went to law school there and I integrated myself with all the other students. There were other students, but a very close friend of mine was from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. He was a Christian 
Indian, from the Malayali community, from the Martoma Church. A very close friend of mine was from Malawi, Krishna Sabjani. I think he was Gujarati. But we became, everybody's Hindu, we became three of the best friends. But we made many friends, we had Jewish friends, we had English friends, they'd invite us home. And uh, eventually, after about two years, I was fortunate that I became the vice president of the oldest debating society, which was so many hundred years old. So I integrated myself, and I was very fortunate that I did well in my, my exams. So I, it was a very, very formative period of my post-secondary education. But my education didn't come from the inn. The inn gave me legal insights. But I was very fortunate. I saw the five top operas. You know, Madame Butterfly, Carmen, Tosca, Aida. I saw Rudolf Nureyev and Margot Fontaine at, at the Covent Garden. I managed to go to the Albert Hall. Now, I wasn't rich, but I was able to go on these cheap seats. And I imbibed in the cultural life that London afforded at the time. So I think it was a very beautiful period of my life, but quite lonely in the beginning. Of course. And then you go, went to Canada too. Then I went back to Africa. I went to oh. Nairobi because what happened, very interesting, I was still carrying a green passport. It was a South African passport. And Kenya had no diplomatic relations with South Africa. I had a permit in my passport of 23 months and I think about 20 days. Had I not left at that time for Kenya, Kenya would have blocked me, they would not have allowed me. Britain would not allow me to stay because South Africa had left the Commonwealth. My only choice was to go back to South Africa and they would have put me into prison in South Africa, perhaps, because I, when I was studying at Grazing, some of my friends were the people who were in the political process. A chap called Bani Desai. The government was looking for him. So if I went back, they'd say, well, you were hobnobbing with people who are, who are dangerous. So I was in a very difficult position. So when I qualified, I could not go to my graduation ceremony because if I stayed for that, I would not have a country. So it was very painful for me to say, after all the struggle, can I not even be, for the greatest moment of my life, to see myself becoming a lawyer? My very close friend was an African former foreign minister of Ghana. He was the president of the UN. His name was Koizen Seki. Wonderful man. He took me to the Kenyan High Commissioner in Great Portland Street, called Dr. Josephat Karanja. Dr. Karanja was a very close friend of his. Karanja took my passport and he told his man in his office, he said, can you check on this? He saw the stamp on it. We were talking and joking. A few minutes later, that man came in and said, I don't even think that this re-entry is valid. I don't think this man can go back. So Karanja looked at me, he was the high commissioner. He said, go back in the next flight. He said, go back very quickly. So I said, I'm going back in about two weeks. He said, go as quickly as possible. We don't know whether you'll be allowed back. But he says, let's try. But don't stay back. So I had to go back. So I went back to Kenya. And I couldn't practice law in Kenya because I had a South African passport. So here am I trained at the oldest law school in the world. I come to Kenya, I do Kenya law, and I pass that. So now I'm a lawyer from two countries. I can't practice because I don't have the permit. So again, there's a struggle for a birthright. Kenya didn't practice apartheid, but they froze the citizenship for all the Indians. So now I could not say, give me my citizenship, when there were thousands of Indians who were still waiting. But later on, you, you could practice... Um... I was able to practice through an accident. I took on a case of an African who had committed murder and I was able to do free cases. So I took a case to say, I will do the case free of charge. They gave me only 10 pounds as a gift. When I took the case on, the immigration department said, why did you agree to do that? It constitutes working. You are going to be working. But I said, I'm not being paid. They said, paid or unpaid, the definition of working is when you are representing somebody. 
So I sent the case back. I gave the file back to the attorney general's office. I said, I can't take it. At that time, there was a Gujarati girl working in the attorney general's office. Her name was Parin Ratnansi, Nairobi girl. Parin said that the deputy public prosecutor wants to know why are you as a lawyer refusing to defend a man who's charged for murder? I said, well, what do I do? Either I'm allowed to work or I'm not allowed to work. I can't defend somebody for murder and then going to prison myself for breaking the law. At which stage, the deputy public prosecutor in Kenya, a chap called Mr. James Karugu, who was from Middle Temple Inn, asked me to come and see him. And he said, what's your problem? And I said, I've been refused to take this case on. He said, go and see the principal immigration officer, tell him I've sent you there. And he should allow you to work in this country. When I went there, the case was over. Somebody else did the case. But the PIO was a man called Mr. Bangwa, who said, welcome. If that's what you wanted to do for this country, we should be able to allow you to work. So he stepped my passport and he said, not only can you work for someone else, but even if you want to open your own office, do so. So I opened my own office and I employed two Africans. So that was in 1971. So this was quite a, a difficult period um, in the in, um, well, 70s was when Uganda had all the... Right. Uh, this was just before Uganda. Just before, yeah. This was actually, this was 12 months before Uganda. So I started practicing and I started doing very well. And suddenly, on the 5th of August, 1972, just as I was coming back from England from a holiday, Amin said all the Indians have to leave Uganda. So I said to myself, my God, what's going to happen to me tomorrow if something happens in Kenya? I also have to leave. So do I now stay on in East Africa? And that's the time when Amin brought this in. Asians are going to everywhere. But few would go to Germany, few would go to Holland, few would end up in Denmark. Somebody's got an auntie who had an uncle who had a cousin in Sweden who ended up in Sweden. Canada took some of the younger people. One country, I don't know if it was Denmark or Sweden, took all the disabled people, because I think those people couldn't get into other countries, were taken by one European country. They took all the disabled people. So uh, that was the period, yes. The arms is a very difficult period. And, and then you went to Canada after, after that? What happened is that when this happened, I was, uh, I was a lawyer to a, an African man from Uganda called Dr. Joe Zaki. Dr. Zaki was a former Attorney General of Uganda, very close friend of our families. When we saw that his family were thrown out and they were going to kill him, he came to our home. So we gave him protection, nobody knew this. We hid him under our bed and we tried to get him an Indian passport or a Canadian passport or whoever. We were not very successful. Eventually we managed to get him out of the country, him and his wife and I think they have five children. Dr. Zaki told me and my sister, he said, don't remain in Africa. I remember Zaki telling me, he said, get out, go. He says, you don't have too long of a time. I wanted to get to Canada, but I had a lot of cases of people to deal with. So if I said, if I leave people's work and they had, and I had, I can't remember, I had in my client's account about 100,000 pounds. That was a lot of money, even today. And I said, do I give it to another lawyer to keep in trust and then leave the country? I had people's title deeds on my table. I had people's cases of inheritance, people who had died, their wills. And I said, no, do I just leave people and go away? So I said, let me see how much I can finish. In the meanwhile, Canada closed the doors. Because in those days, you could get into Canada and apply from within Canada. Canada said, no, no, you can't apply from within Canada. Could you apply from outside? I had to apply from outside. When I applied from outside, the Canadian process became very long-winded. So I was able to save these files, work in Nairobi, but in the process my sister got in, my younger sister, what my father and my mother said, said, why don't you let her go? He told my sister, you go, and told me, you stay behind. So my sister got in, and I was left behind. So then later on, when you reached Canada, uh, tell us a bit about how this new country influenced you. Obviously, 
moving from South Africa to Kenya to England and yeah. now to Canada. I mean, I fell in love with Canada the first evening. Did you? <laughs> I was taking, somebody gave me a ride into the city and I saw, funny enough, I saw a building that looked like a transistor radio all lit up. And that was on like a little hill. That was the Bata building. I never realized that that was the building that was going to become the Ismaili center in the years to come. And my book was launched there. <laughs> Ironically enough, when I was at the book launch, I said, my God, we're sitting on a building here, which was the first building I saw and I fell in love with. Yes, Canada was a country of the future. I was there in the autumn of 1973. I just loved it. And my sisters and brothers were there. And they had a beautiful apartment and they were telling me what they were doing. And, and I was working with a firm in Britain, Lou Silken and Partners, and my boss was a shadow cabinet minister. I was a junior cabinet minister, John Fraser. He's very ill now, wonderful human being. He said, look, why don't you stay over in England? You can work with our firm, become a solicitor. And I said, John, you know, the whole family is in Canada. Uh, I want to go where my parents are. We've been moving and ch changing countries all over our life. I want to be with them. He said, no, why don't you stay? There may be a future for you in England. But my heart was in Canada. So I, but then there was another problem. Canada wouldn't let me practice. They said, with a British qualification, you can't practice. You have to have a law degree. And the Inns of Court is not a law degree. So I had to go back to university for another three years. Another two years. And I can say this, I ended up selling hot dogs in the street to earn money. I didn't have enough money to study. So I ended up from being a criminal lawyer in Kenya to working with a very top immigration lawyers in, in England with somebody who was in the British cabinet to ending up in a small town in Kingston, Ontario, and every Saturday I had to sell hamburgers and uh, hot dogs in the street to, to, to earn a few pennies. And also, Canada made it clear to me that they don't need lawyers. I was told very clearly that when they gave me a permit, a visa, they said, we don't need lawyers, and this doesn't mean that you'll be able to live in Canada. So back to the insecurity, I don't know where I'm going to practice, where I'm going to practice, and this is the third continent. I'm studying law for the third time in my life. So I wanted to ask myself, there are 192 countries in the world. Do I have to still do 109, 169 countries laws before I can find a homeland? In the end, you qualified in, in Canada. I qualified in Canada. And then were you able to practice there? Again, another historical accident. I wasn't allowed to practice there. But a professor at my university heard my story. <laughs> I didn't tell him my story, but one day I had a, a mock case and I had to take the role of a lawyer. When he heard me, he said, you sound like a real lawyer. So I said, I am a real lawyer. So he said, what the hell are you doing here? I said, well, you people don't open your doors to me. I've got to study again. So he took my matter up with a person in the Canadian government who himself was the legal advisor to the Director General of Immigration, of Manpower. His name was John Hucker, who was, like me, twice a refugee. <laughs> so when the guy heard my story, he said, this sounds like deja vu. So he went and he, over a period of time, helped me. Eventually, I got my landed status in Canada after being there for three years. You know, I had a good fortune of working for the Office of His Highness the Aga Khan, because after I got my permission to work in Canada, it's very interesting, life always takes different twists, which you never know. Uh, eventually, I got uh, permission to work in Canada, I got my landed status, and I was in my practice for about three years, when this opportunity arose for me to work in the Aga Khan Secretariat. And so I had a choice, I had three choices. One choice was to work as a lawyer in Canada, in the country that, I, that had just adopted me. The other choice I had was I wanted to go and study diplomacy in America. I had applied to the Fletcher School of Diplomacy, which is a very globally renowned place to study international relations. And I remembered my friend Kwaizen Saki, who was the president of the UN, telling me 10 years earlier that one day you should go to this top university to become a diplomat. 
I never had a country, so I wouldn't, didn't know which country I would be a diplomat of. But now that I became a Canadian, I said, well, there's some hope in the future. And during that time, I was also uh, asked by the Secretary of His Highness if I'd come in to work in Europe. And I decided to go and leave Canada and come to France. So here's another country in my repertoire where I happened to spend 31 years. So those 31 years I worked for the Ismaili Imamate and also for the programs that today are known as the Aga Khan Development Network. It's the largest development not-for-profit network in the world. Uh, it contributes towards human development in a number of countries, 50, 60 countries, ranging from early childhood education, uh, economic development, rural support programs. It runs large rural support programs in Gujarat, for example. Many of the Czech dams in Gujarat were built by them. It runs cultural programs, the largest architectural award in the world. Prize has been given by the Aga Khan's network. It has programs on nursing, uh, on, on uh, medical education in places like Uganda, Kenya. You know Nairobi, uh, Lataben, the Aga Khan hospital is a teaching hospital. So these are programs that were run by the Ismaili community over the last hundred years, which over time became part of the national programs of those countries towards development, and today they become international programs. That means the Aga Khan and the Imamate is in connection or in collaboration with the Canadian government. They run in the Global Center of Pluralism. Uh, in Portugal, there are programs of the Portuguese government, uh, there are programs of the Tajik government, programs of the Indian government, the whole uh, cultural uh, contribution in India is part of the Aga Khan Development Network. I was fortunate to, to be able to work at a time when His Highness was consolidating all those programs and giving them both a national and an international dimension. Now the Aga Khan, uh, he doesn't look at his work as philanthropy, he looks at it as part of his remit as the Imam of the Ismaili Muslims. He says his role is to not only provide religious guidance, but his role is to look after the security of his followers, but also to help them to contribute to the countries in which they live, to those who are in need. So that means the Ismaili community, wherever they are, they will always be running projects like health projects, economic development, cultural programs, educational programs. And the volunteers give a lot of their time. So the system works so well because every Ismaili will give free time. And so instead of one and one making two, one and one makes three because you get synergy. And the institutions of the Imam work very closely with governmental institutions, other non-governmental organizations towards the contribution of what we would today call a robust civil society. The Ismaili, the Aga Khan Development Network is an example of a global civil society institutions that does not discriminate on the basis of gender, on the basis of race, on the basis of faith. The bottom line is what are the needs of people and how do you involve people in their own betterment so they can take ownership of the program. And the program ranges across the board in development from early childhood to tertiary education, healthcare, housing, economic development, cultural development. It's a, it's a combination of all these processes to give people a better chance of self-fulfillment. And I was very fortunate that I spent 30 years in that process. So I gave up law. I didn't practice law. I was brought into different areas of the Aga Khan's work and I learned a lot. So it seems like your um, journey has uh, given you different lenses of perception and there is amalgamation of identities from travel to different countries. Yet your DNA lies deep in the Indian soil. Yeah. <laughs> Would you say this is true? To a great extent, I feel, I feel at home in many different contexts. I mean, I'm very much at home in England. I love this country because Britain is a great country. It's a country that 
there's allowed freedom, there's rule of law. I love Canada, because Canada is a country of the future. Uh, I love Africa, I can, I can, I, if I go into the African townships, I can hear the sound of music and I can see African children dancing and I'll get up and dance with them. Uh, I find that India has a great pool. Yes, India has a great pool because to me, India is not Bollywood. India is not the India people say that it's this piece and not that. To me, India is the India that Amartya Sen speaks about. The culture of 5,000 years back. It's a part of the world that gave the world Buddhism. It's part of the world that had great philosophies and philosophers of the past. And today when you tell me India, I love the India of the present day. I think it's very exciting, it's very vibrant. When I'm in Mumbai, I feel so excited. Uh, when I look at Indian movies and Indian film stars, uh, from Ashwarya Ray and right up to uh, Priyanka Chopra and all that. I say, wonderful, it's lovely. But to me, India is more than that. That part of India appeals to me. But what appeals very much to me in India is the India I'd like to preserve in me. It's an India that's not narrow. It's an India that goes, it's the India that Rabindranath Tagore spoke about. The universalism the premiation of the human spirit, the embodiment of the diversity of cultures that make up this beautiful country. And so if you ask me, is my, my DNA in India? Yes, it is. Factually it is there, but also emotionally it's there. I mean, when I look at India and the very positive things it stands for, that appeals very much to me. And so I do find that I can I can grapple with my multiple identities. I do not see any one of my identity conflicting with another. But it will conflict with the other if the identities that make up me are given only limited shapes. So I am a Muslim, but I see it as a universal vision. I am an Indian, I see it as a universal vision. I am an African. But I'm not an African just in one limited sense. When I look at Ubuntu, I see myself as part of that vision that made me. Uh, I'm British. I don't look at my British whether it's Brexit or non-Brexit. When I think of Britain, I think of the greater things that I learned at the Inns of Court. The great contribution like people like Francis Bacon. The great contribution of great English legal visionaries who contributed to the rule of law. And so I look at my identity as encompassing the larger visions of all those identities, rather than the limited visions of those things. And I feel, I feel very enriched, I do not feel limited. What is your message for the lives for the communities today? You know, I think diasporic vigor Diasporic strength and diasporic hybridity has tremendous, tremendous potential. I think today, many years ago, I was talking to the late Manubai Madhwani. He's a very wise man, wonderful human being. Humble, humility, but depth. And I think I was reading in the Madhwani office that the diasporic Indian community constitutes a major global economic entity in the years to come. There are 19 million Indians in the diaspora. 19 million. I'm talking of Guyana, Fiji, Mauritius, Madagascar, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, United States, Canada, Britain, Europe. And I think there's a lot of vigor there. I mean, when I think, when I look around, just, just around today in the last few days, Gurinder Chadha has come up with this big film. She's a Kenyan Punjabi girl. Mira Nair is from Mumbai. When I think of Ashwin Singh in South Africa as a filmmaker, very outstanding. When I think of diasporic communities, I mean, just give you one small example before I close up without solving self-serving. 40 years ago in Canada, three young boys came with their parents the, all they had was what they could bring in their suitcase. 
Today, one of the three is the world's leading brain surgeon, Amin Kasim. He's in Ottawa. He's one of the few people who can remove a tumor from the brain through the nose. The second one did some world breakthrough work on club foot, a chap called Shafiq Pirani. He's from Kampala. He got a grant from the Canadian International Development Agency and he went back to Mulago Hospital and this Poncieta club foot thing, Ponciana or something, he is pioneered at Malago Hospital. And the third person, forgive me, happens to be a nephew of mine, he came with one big book that his mother gave him for his birthday. She spent 27 shillings. It was called Introduction to Biology by D.G. King. And he kept a woman alive in Canada by taking her lungs out for six days. She was dying. She was suffering from cystic fibrosis kept her alive on an artificial lung for six days until he got a donation of a lung. And today he saved her life. Now these three kids are from the diaspora. I'm just talking of the African diaspora. Think about the great stuff that's done by India, by Bangladesh, by Pakistan, by so many other countries. And you find today in America when you read Mira Kamda's Planet India, think of India, Indra Nui, Indra What's the name of the woman who works for Pepsi? Inda, yeah. yeah. Inda Nui or something. Mm -hmm. These are the people who have contributed to the Silicon Valley, to the changes that have taken place in India, to the field of art, music, culture, civil society, law, medicine. I think. Not that others are not contributing, but I think diasporic communities have a lot to contribute. The Jewish example is a case in point. They've contributed very richly. But when you go across the board, you'll see Latin American diasporic communities, you'll find Indian diasporic communities, you'll find African diasporic communities. I think diasporas create a new hybridity. And if we are open enough to understand that the family of tomorrow is bicultural, it's biracial, it's binational, it's bi-religious. We need to understand that our children are going to go out into the world. They're going to embrace the new technology, the new knowledge, but they will combine, hopefully, their cultural identities, their cultural roots with the new dimensions that can be created in the new societies. And who knows, our children will probably do wondrous things in using their education. Look at what's happening in Britain. I mean, uh, yesterday I read in the newspaper uh, a little girl who gave the 3D dimension of her father's kidney in her body. She gave it to the Museum of Medical Science. And the person who conducted the role that his name was Pankaj Chandak or something. It sounded like a Gujarati. So I said, yeah, he's a Gujarati doctor, an English kid, transplant technology, and they're all working together. So to me, that's the richness, not the xenophobic feeling to say, I am great, that's my past, you do not belong there. I think I can only be great if you are part of my journey. When you are part of my journey and together we go on to the journey to the future, then my past will be even greater than what I imagine it. It will really be great. Even if it's an imaginary past, it will be a great past. And I think that's where I would say to diasporic communities, there's a lot of hope, there's a lot of scope. Spirit Resolution is a social movement that says that if you have a dispute, the law is not the only place to go to. The law courts are not the only place to go to. Your law can be in the background, but two people can have a third party mediator or mediators who are impartial, and you can construct an agreement among yourselves, which is based very much on the traditional processes of resolving conflict outside law. There could be con resolving conflict outside law. It can be resolving conflict outside war. 
Because if two groups or two parties or two countries are having a problem, they can resolve it without going through armaments and killing and soldiers and all that. So ADR is the new wave of today and tomorrow. And today they say 95% of all cases in a court of law never get heard. And countries and courts and individuals and NGOs are promoting mediation as a way of resolving conflict. Now, it's not only mediation, it's arbitration, which is a process that business people use. Arbitration is used for conflict between countries. You know, arbitration uh, committees that will deal whether islands belong to Japan or belong to another country or belong to America or belong to Canada, water rights, negligence cases, professional negligence cases, international transplant, uh, implant cases, breast implants, tobacco cases, in what's called as mass torts. There is a global movement toward resolve, towards resolving these issues outside the adversarial process. And that whole bundle is called alternative dispute resolution. To what extent does it reflect my own life? Yes, to a certain extent, two things. Mahatma Gandhi started this when he came to South Africa. He was called to fight in a case, but eventually solved it through arbitration between Dada Abdullah and Haji Khan Muhammad, who were cousins. Gandhi, a Gujarati lawyer, got two Muslim business people who were also Gujaratis to solve their problem. Mandela used it in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. He also used it as a negotiating trait. So A was those influences in my life. The second influence in my life was through my family. My father and his brothers unfortunately ended up in court over a family business which started when I was two years old and got resolved when I became a lawyer, not through me, but through some other people. So to me, I believe that the third way, the middle way, is a much better way. You may not get as much as in a court of law, but you gain your sanity, you gain your integrity, and eventually you also gain your friendship. What is the, the Gandhi um, King Akira Award? Uh, the Gandhi King Akira Award is an award given by the alma mater of Martin Luther King, Morehouse College in Atlanta. And this is given every year to an, a person who's done certain seminal work in the field of community building or peace initiatives. And I believe I was the recipient of this in 2016 for the contribution I had made to training mediators in 20 countries of the world. I cannot claim credit for that because it was His Highness's vision that gave me the opportunity to develop a program. But at the end of the day, we trained about a thousand mediators in 22 countries uh, in a program that has saved a lot of, lot of anguish and pain to people who are in dispute. And the Gandhi Ikeda Martin Luther King Prize was given after three people. Mahatma Gandhi, whose philosophy to negotiate a settlement, Martin Luther King for his non-violence work, and Daisaku Ikeda. Dr. Ikeda is a Japanese Gandhi who started this program with one country and five million people. Today it's got 12 million adherents in 192 countries. And so they have instituted a prize in the name of those three giants for people who have done work in different fields of community building, non-violence, mediation, mediated settlement. I just feel humble that uh, I happen to be part of the group. I don't think that personally I've done that great stuff compared to some of the giants. But I think like anything else, uh, I've accepted it with grace and with humility, uh, saying that I wish I could do more.